like something. Is the spirit in life. We are told that God is spirit. Then we are told that in him is life. And the life is the light of men. Then we are told in the book of John that Andrew found him when he called his brother Peter and said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. On who did he find, really? We have found him, the Spirit who gives life. But let me share with you an experience of mine. But bear in mind as I tell you, that if anyone should ever say to you, look, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. Don't believe him for the simple reason, when you find him, you are like him. Yet, one who is found him can bring you to him. But do not let him point to anyone other than yourself who is the Christ. No matter who he is, how wise he seems to be, how powerful he is, don't believe him. There is no being in the world outside of self that you ever find as Christ. But you will find him. And when you find him, you are just like him. That's the place you are. Your place raised to the eighth degree of beauty and majesty. But your place. So here in him is life. And this life is the life of me. By him all things were made. And without him was not anything made that was made. Not anything, regardless of what it is. Twelve years ago, back in New York City, I tasted of the power of the age to come. That power that you and I will share together as one when we're all awake. It's a fantastic power. But since that day across the country, as I would tell the story of my experience of this power, one question was always asked. I was unable to answer that question, save from speculation. But they did not wish me to speculate. Did I know from experience? And I did not know from experience. I only knew from experience the positive side of this power. I did not know the negative side. And I met no one in my travels who had experienced either the positive or the negative until this past spring in L.A. So I will share with you first the positive side that was my experience, and then the negative side that was this lady's experience done in L.A. As I told you, it was 12 years ago. I was taken in spirit, and I came upon a scene, a perfectly normal scene just like this. But it was in a New England town, about to 200 years ago. You see, nothing passes away. That scene was just as alive, although if you had lived 200 years ago, to you it would have been the only reality. And the past relative to it would not exist, and the future relative to it would not exist. Only it would exist. And today this exists, and we think because it was 200 years ago, it has ceased to be. But I know it hasn't ceased to be, because I came about it. Are these things in any way interfering? Well, I came upon this scene. It was a restaurant. It was an early, I would call it a Sunday afternoon. I felt the atmosphere of Sunday. They were all dining, a very early dinner. There was an enormous bay window looking out upon a pastoral sea. Lovely trees, waving grass, a bird was in flight, and a family of four, two young men in their early twenties, and I take, take it that the lady and gentleman present were their parents. They were in their early forties. 
A waitress is walking towards the table with what I took to be a second course, because they were drinking soup. The young man of about 21 or 22 facing me had brought the spoon almost to his mouth, just about here. As I came in spirit into this place, I knew that if I could arrest within me an activity that I felt, that everything within my focus would freeze. No sooner did I know it than I tried it, and I stilled in me an activity that I felt. As I did so, everything froze. The diner's dining, dying not. The young man couldn't move the spoon beyond where I arrested it. The waitress walking, walk not. The bird flying, flew not. The little grass waving, wave not. The leaves falling, which I could see before I arrested it, fell not. And everything froze as though I came into a museum, and these things were suspended by invisible threads. It seemed that way. Then I investigated. I went close and looked at these people, and they seemed to me dead. They seemed to be not alive. They could have been made of clay. Everything was frozen. And then when I had satisfied myself that they were really dead, or that they to be dead, then I released within me an activity which I had frozen. As I released it, everything moved on in its course. The waitress walked. The young man completed the action of taking soup. The bird completed its flight. The leaves began to fall. The, uh, the little grass began to wave once more, and everything once more became animated. Well, having had that experience, I realized that life was in me, that life was an activity of my own wonderful imagination. Well, the Bible calls it spirit. For he is spirit, and in him is life. For I discovered what life really was. I arrested an activity in me, and they were not alive. I released that activity in me on and then, and they were once more animated. I reanimated the entire scene. I discovered that what we call laws of nature, like gravity, is only, I would say, it's not really an absolute law, because were it an absolute law, the bird in flight should have fallen when arrested. The leaves should have continued. They should not really be suspended in space. But at least the bird in flight would have fallen, but it didn't. And the moment I released it, it continued in its flight to fulfill its purpose. I can see where the waiters would not fall. I can see where the four diners could be arrested and yet not in some strange way denied the law of gravity, but not the bird. However, as I saw it, my entire concept of life as I knew it changed. So I told that story across the country in the major cities as I visited these cities. One question that is always asked is this. Were the four diners aware of the fact that they were frozen? Was the waitress aware? Well, I couldn't answer. I didn't know. I only knew as far as I'm concerned they were dead. They were frozen. And they seemed not only to be inanimate, but to be devoid of any possibility of ever being animated. Until I released it from within me. When I released that activity, which now I know to be life, it once more became alive. Well, this spring in L.A., this couple, they live on the beach of in Malibu. And it's her custom to go walking every day on the sands. And this day in question, as she was walking, looking out to an animated ocean, and seeing people on the beach walking, and everyone a normal, normal way of living. And suddenly, and these are her words, she said, never suddenly, as I'm watching the animated, not an angry ocean, but quite a live ocean, suddenly someone or something turned me off. And I was nothing. These are her words. The ocean was nothing. The people were nothing. Everything was nothing. I stood there aware of being nothing. Then whatever turned me off, or whoever it was that turned me off, turned me on again. And then once more I became someone. And the ocean something, and everything round about me, once more became animated and 
in something. Now, I can answer that question based upon her experience. I had the positive experience of life in myself, for I arrested it and turned it on again. But I didn't know that when I arrested it and the four divers stopped and were still in their tracks and the waitress was still and the birds still, that they had the experience of being nothing. So now I know that that's our future, to actually taste of the powers of the age to come. Then it throws light on the great trial of history. For here is the embodiment of truth, the embodiment of life itself, a key low on our level. And he stands before the personification of reason in this world. And reason asked him, where are you from? And he did not answer. And then Pilate said to him, do you not know that I have the power to release you or the power to crucify you? He said, you would have no power over me had it not been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you, he has the greater sin. That there was no power here whatsoever unless animated from above. That from above spirit animates this entire field of becomes. And we have our intentions. It could be arrested as this lady herself. And she felt herself to be nothing. And then someone who turned it off, turned it on, and once more she felt she was something. Now there in the book of John, in him was life. And life was the life of men. But the light was in him. And our consciousness is simply the light turned on. When he turns it off, the light is turned off and we are nothing. Now, it is in him that is life. By him all things are made. Without him there was not anything made that was made. So now I can introduce you to it. And do not look outside of yourself to find him. You're going to find him within yourself. You may not see him. Actually, as I described it last night, telling you the story of you and telling you the story of my own experience when I encountered myself in deep meditation, meditating me, making this thing an animated form that moves across this creator's face. But here, if he makes all things, good, bad, and indifferent, and without him, not one thing was ever made. Well, then let us tell you the story. A gentleman writes me, in 1933, he was sailing on the Danube from Vienna to Budapest. But when he came into Budapest, the lights were on. It was quite late. He was so startled with the sheer beauty of the lights of Budapest that he had an intense longing always capture that, and promised himself that when he returned to America, he would look all over to find a place that would give him just such a view or something similar. He returned to his home in Missouri, and then moved on to Southern California. And there in the hills of Southern California, there was a view of that fabulous basin when it's all lit up at night, as he described it like some wonderful lady of the evening with all of her jewelry on. And it simply stunned him. He saw nothing. Well, he bought a place with that view. Tore up the side and placed an enormous window so he could always see the view. Then, ten years ago, the one below him had planted a huge grove, really, of poplar trees. And he knew in time the poplar trees would grow and obscure his view. He knew it. Well, but the time came, which is only about a year ago, that the leaves came and the branches came and the view is obscured. In the meanwhile, he started coming to my meetings. He's been coming two years now. He said, I will apply this principle of imagining. If imagining creates reality, I will stand here at this window and with my eyes shut to the obvious, I will see the view that I have seen for years. The view I fell in love with first back in Budapest, and the view I fell in love with here when I first saw it. 
and for one solid week, he simply saw what formerly he remembered seeing. I told the story of I Remember When, which was a vision of mine to share with those who would come to my meetings. So having remembered my vision of I Remember When, I think you've heard that vision of mine. And for one solid week daily, he would look and see the sight that he ought to see if the doctor trees were not there. In one month, the poplar trees died. Every tree that dropped the side died. Not all the poplar trees, but every one within view of that actually died. At first there was a shock. Then he said to himself, no, love cannot kill love. And life cannot kill life. Life simply has rearranged itself to conform to the image of my mind. So here he discovered Christ. He said, but Christ wouldn't kill. He must listen carefully to the words. He does everything. I kill, I make alive. I will, I heal. I create the light, I form the darkness. I do all things. There is no, no God but God. For if these things died before his very vision, well then they died. And the man below had, for insurance purposes, to remove the trees. So he removed all the dead trees. Then he says, I had a cat. I loved the cat. And the cat tore all of my lovely rugs apart. And all of my lovely chairs apart. I really loved the cat. I did not get new rugs apart. Immediately, for the simple reason that when I was hoping that she would die. She was 15 years old, but she seemed to be, to be, to be determined to outlive Masuka Medusa. So here, the cat didn't die. He didn't want to kill the cat. He just wanted the cat to be trained. So he imagined the rug in the backyard, which the cat had never used. The cat was 15 years old, and he had that cat for 15 years that the cat was on the outside, tearing everything apart from that rock. Three days later, the cat went out and started using the rug instead of the carpets. And till the day she died, it never once came back and tore the rocks. But now he has found Christ. Because in him is life. He took life from the trees and rearranged them. There was a cat performing a certain action for 15 years, what a habit formed. And in three days that habit could be broken. And remained broken until she made her exit from this world. Well, a gentleman in the audience, when I told that story, it never occurred to him to try it until that moment when he heard the story. Well, he had a problem similar to the poplar trees, only there were not poplar trees. Seeing it at his dining room table, he used to feast upon a scene across a valley. And suddenly, the next door neighbor planted bamboo trees. The bamboos came and plucked off the entire scene. He didn't tell his wife or the neighbor what he was doing. But he would physically seat himself at the table and then look off into space and remember what he could see before the trees grew. And he saw it clearly in his mind's eye. And for one solid week, that's what he did. But when he came home, beginning of the second week, his wife met him. I said, do you know what has happened today? Our neighbor has removed all the bamboos. It was his urge. He thought he initiated the desire to completely change all the backyard and remove all the bamboos. He did not have to go next door to the neighbor and persuade him to do the gracious, decent thing as a neighbor. He didn't tell the wives or so, because she might have done it. He simply sat there quietly and looked, and he saw what he would see if there were no trees there. So here are two. He found Christ, for only Christ can make a thing. Now a third party. He said, I have a little girl eight years old. I got thinking, I'm not doing enough for my child. I don't see her enough. I should spend more time with her. 
that was all they said to himself. Then he said, you know, I'm very fond of jet flying. So one day, I thought I would enjoy an imaginary flight. I found myself getting ready with my little girl and my wife. We were all getting ready to go off. We could go fly. But strangely enough, as we went through the door, only my little girl seemed to aid in my imagination. She had never flown before. So I didn't fly the streets. I found myself right at the state at the uh, airport. I'm explaining to my little girl all the things about the airport. Incoming planes, departing planes, weighing all the baggage and all these things. Then instead of walking up the ramp, I found myself on the plane. I placed my little girl in my imagination at the window. Then I felt the takeoff. And here I am describing to her the things below on the ground, the buildings, the sites, all these things to her. And then I broke it. That was all. A month later, I said to my little girl, Lynn, I said, Lynn, on April the 11th, it is Father's Day and Daughter's Day. Father's Daughter's Day. So that day, you and I will spend together, just the two of us. What we will do, I don't know. But it came the morning of the 11th of April. And my wife is dressing, my little girl is dressing, I'm dressing. But it's just for me and myself. But we went through the door together because my wife had a date with a beautician. And then we parted company at all. I went to my car. I thought, no, what would I do with Lynn for the whole day? Well, I would go and have breakfast first. And I'll take her to the beach. And following a lovely time at the beach, I'll take her to lunch. After lunch, I'll take her to the movies. So I got on the San Diego freeway. And then I am tearing down on the freeway when suddenly a feeling possessed me that I could not shake. And that feeling was to get over to the airport and take a jet to San Diego and go to the zoo. I went over to the airport, got on that jet with Lee. Here I am in the San Diego Zoo. I am almost at the end of my trip. And it dawned upon me what I had done in imagination. The very thing I had done, say, six weeks before, now comes to fulfillment. I didn't recognize it when it happened. He found Christ. I hope by these stories, without tasting of the power of the age to come, you will recognize Christ in you. For it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Not any Christ to mystery. So when you hear the word Jesus, you make a mental image of being outside of yourself. When you hear the word Jesus Christ, and you think of something on the outside that lived in time and space, as a number tens of millions do, then that's not he. You haven't found him. When you find him, you think of no one but that presence within you that brings everything into being in your will. He's always brought it, he's bringing it, and he always will bring it. And there is no other Christ. So when you hear the word, automatically check yourself. What you think of when you hear the word Jesus Christ. If you make any mental image of another other than yourself, you have a false image. Do not believe. So if anyone should ever come to you saying, look, here is Christ. Or look, there he is. Do not believe. But in spite of that, unnumbered crowds who believe themselves the students of the Bible will jack you upon it and think that you are arrogant. And any claim on your part, but make no claim, is simply blasphemy. Yet there will never be another Christ in your life. So I can introduce you tonight to him, as Peter was introduced by Andrew. Andrew found him first. Andrew discovered what he did to discover the creative power within him, who know it is not recording. What Philip did to discover it and to bring the Daniel to it, it's not recorded. But it is told in story form. A man in a strange way has misunderstood the story. I know how he calls the grand parable history. It isn't history, it's divine history where this thing really comes into being in us. As he comes in us, be tested. Come test yourself and see. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. For well, these three met the test. Unnumbered hundreds across the country are meeting the test. They may go back through habit and find that they need some other comfort or some greater comfort in the believing of another. I ask you to find in this.
this night, trust in this night, and take any problem in your world and exercise the Christ in you before you taste of the power of the age to come. And see if he doesn't bring that thing into your world. For by him all things are made. Without him there is nothing made that was made. Nor will there anything be made tomorrow by any other power. The only power in the world is Christ. In him is life, and that light is the light of men. And you will one day have the experience of shutting it off and watching people stand still. And if you remember tonight's message, you will know that they are saying within themselves, I am nothing. Absolutely nothing. As they have become aware of what was that made, and it is still, it is nothing. And then you will turn it on again, and all the room as they intended before you close it off. And that's the whole vast world in the treaty. So when I said this is an animated field, we understand the ink of Romans. We were made subject unto futility, not willingly, but by the reason of the will of him who subjected us in hope. That the creature will be made free or set free from this bondage to corruption and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. When that something is set free in man, he joins the heavenly host and he is gone with it. And tomorrow you and I will act be controlling and animating this meeting it goes on forever until that moment in time when one is right to be awakened and be detached from it. Another moment, another one detached from it. And we are the ones who will be doing it. Before we are actually detached from it, we taste of this power of the age to come. So here, if you are not with us, when I tell you my vision, to read. 
Actually became us until he awakens in us. Let us test his power. 
see if we can't bring things into this world that seemingly are seemingly impossible. Like a 15 year habit of a cat, that's an impossible thing. And to have a habit of that nature of 15 years, broken in three days, without raising a finger to do it, is not an impossible thing. For with God, all things are possible. It may be impossible to man, but that man didn't do it. He sat and fired in his mind and saw, and saw the cat on the outside, turning up the maps of the space there for the purpose to sharpen her toes or nails, but not his lovely mouth. And suddenly the cat goes out and performs the act which in his mind's eye he saw. Who did it? But only Christ could do it, therefore he found Christ. So here next time, I hope you will come. At least I've introduced you to him, but there's no compulsion like that and make you accept him. So many people find it more comforting to go before a picture on a wall or some piece of little marble resembling a human form and worship it. Although we are warned all through scripture to make no labor image unto me, but none, many will still do it. I was on TV myself with this panel of mine. And this archaeologist came on, and we had two ministers, one Baptist and one Adventist, and plus this uh, archaeologist. When I told them about my experiences, of course, they did nothing to them because that is not the way they understand the great, the great Christian mystery. That isn't so at all, as far as they were concerned. Then as the hours went on to our camp, to our shelter, this archaeologist takes some huge big canvas. And he begins to unveil it before the camera's eye. And here he is telling us that this is an actual picture, but the actual picture of Christ Jesus. That the lights coming through have actually gone up on some kind of a floor and left the imprint. I said to him, I shouldn't have done it because that's the one kind. I said, You are an archaeologist and you accept that. I said, No, you two are ministers of the word, as you say. Aren't you told that unless you look like him, that's not he? The word is that in the book of John, the first epistle of John, the third chapter, that here it does not get a clear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. I said to the archaeologist, do you look like him? Do you think he resembles what you're looking at? You don't. I don't. And they don't. And let you dare to tell this vast audience through TV that this is an actual picture of Jesus Christ? All the ministers want to go along with that. They want to go along with that. They want to believe in something outside themselves to whom they can turn. So few will accept the true Jesus. They haven't the courage to actually accept him and live in his name and only call upon his name, and his name is I. That's his name. So instead of calling with the name called Jesus, call, say, I, that's how you do it, and say, I am this, I am making the cat, what am I doing with the cat? I am seeing the cat outside now, that's what I'm doing with the cat, and the cat takes three days, all right, so it takes three days to break a 15 year habit. And what you're doing now, I am seeing the beautiful scene across the valley. What scene? But don't you see it? Well, I'm saying that I am seeing a beautiful scene across the valley. But you can't if he's had it to anyone else. Look at the trees blocking your view. I am seeing the scene. And they die. And then I'm seeing another scene. And the man chops them down. And no one will believe for one moment that he who is seeing it is exercising Christ. But I will tell all of them, you wait. The day will come maybe tonight. You will taste of a fantastic power. The power that animates the whole vast dream of the universe and turns it on its axis. And the day will come, you will be detached from it. And you will be among those who are turning it and watching eagerly for the word to hatch out. As the word is hatching out, the very one in whom it hatches, you detach it. Let him walk the field for a little while longer. And when he makes his exit, having gone through all these scenes, he is detached, detached permanently. And he will join the heavenly host. And then everyone in time is connected one by one. Not in groups, all one by one. So here, the spirit gives life. They got into the spirit, a man gets to the spirit of talking in his imagination with a little girl in the lead. He completely forgets what he did. And here, the wife doesn't join them. He didn't take the wife beyond the door. 
in his imagination. He only took his daughter because she was the one that really thrilled him. Because she had never gone to a plane before. The wife had flown. That's no fear to talk to her about flight. But someone who hasn't flown, you want to comfort them. You want to protect them. Make them at ease. And so he takes the little girl in his mind with eye and shows how things are weighed and how things move up towards the departure. How things are coming in and how they get off. And then when you get aboard, the final little girl of eight, I'll put it next to the window and explain all the things we told her to comfort her. That's what he did. And here he is at the zoo, almost at the end of the journey. He does like this, what I did. I did this exactly six weeks ago. Again, we do not recognize our own harvest. But at least he knows today who Jesus Christ is. When I came back from Barbados last month, there was a letter waiting for me from this man. The most marvelous letter. He said, now you taught me how to use my imagination. Well, I had the biggest economic month in the month of July. I'm having a bigger focus than I had July. And July was my biggest economic month since I have been in business. And the man is 40 years old. He said, but I had something far more startling than that. These things are essential in the world of season. One must have money, and I, I must have it. I have a family. I have all the obligations that the no one of family, and I've assumed these obligations, so I must meet them. And I'm going to embark you well since I began to use my imagination. But I have three heavenly mystical experiences that I wouldn't get all the money in the world if I had to give them up. Here I might, strangely enough, as I was going to bed, I began to to contemplate the joy of having heard of Christ Jesus. And suddenly I got myself moved into infinite space. I had no body. I was a center of consciousness with feeling, but no body. And the strangest, most fantastic being is accompanying me as I am moving through infinite space. And all I could say, and I heard that myself say, God, 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 we begin the word God. Then I came back in sheer bliss. It was just joy. I suddenly closed my eyes again after I contemplated it for a moment, and I repeated the scene. The whole thing repeated it. And I came back even more ecstatic than the first. And last I said to him, as I called upon one of my clients, I sat in the car, and I thought, this is too early to go home. So what I would do, I'll sit here and simply meditate. As I closed my eyes, I suddenly became aware of being just the center of feeling. And through the door I went without opening the door of the car. I went through an adjacent hospital without opening the doors of the hospital. I went through all the rooms in the hospital and up the very end. And strangely enough, never. I actually saw the infinite soul of God. I saw it and I knew it was the soul of God. And I fused with it. As I fused with it, the words came into my being. I kept repeating to myself, I and the Father are one. We are one. And I kept on saying, one, 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 one. And I kept repeating the words, one. And that happened. Now we say, while sitting in the car, I was so elated. I sat there in the same meditative mood. And suddenly before me came a flame contained in what would be the area of an automobile tire. A plane that is consuming nothing, burning, but without consuming anything. And suddenly, out of nowhere, who approached? Moses approached. And I knew it was Moses. He approached, clothed in a tan robe, and looked into the fire. And then, to the right, came Abraham clothed in a white robe. And then came Paul. And I knew these things intimately. And I knew it was Paul, I knew it was Abraham, and I knew it was actually Moses. I can't tell you how I knew, but I knew. The three of them merged into one being, and I knew the name of that one being, and that one being was Jesus. I looked at the body, and out of the body of Jesus, who do you think I saw then? I saw myself. I am coming out of the body of Jesus. It is my body. Now here is this man, you only walk too well by the use of his imagination in business, and would give the whole thing up for the ecstasy of these mystical experiences. But he does not think about anything. He has found Christ. Found Christ within himself, who can take care of his family beautifully, and still have these expanding, wonderful mystical experiences. Now here's a chap that 
accept reincarnation. I don't. People accept it to justify the inequalities of birth. But I don't see the inequalities as an essential part of God's plan. That's part of his training. He's not a God of retribution. People insist that God must be as man Kibelo is, because he is a being of retribution. He gets eaten an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But God is a God of love. And that's why if he puts himself through the furnace, it's himself that goes through the furnace, that he may shape you right into his likeness. His purpose is to make man in his image. The right of that is a play, without the play's consent. The play can't question my right to shape it. And I may be hurting. Maybe be hurting as I put him on that wheel. And we are hurt on the wheel. But when we come up, we are gone. Endowed with life in ourselves. So I'm talking to you as the same clay that you are. I can tell you as I stand here, I have tasted of the power of the age to come. The promise that in him is life. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So when I am designated Son of God by reason of my resurrection from the dead, as I am told in the book of Romans, well then I would have complete life in myself. Before the full is complete, I have tasted of it. I know what it is to stop the wheel, and here's a section of it, and start it again. But well, that is our destiny, to have life in ourselves as our Father has life in himself. I would accept that, and I would accept the word prayer. The word prayer used to disturb me, fear the Lord. I find in my concordance today that the word has been wrongly translated because our use of the word, maybe the word prayer meant centuries ago, what today our scholar claims the word reading means, which is reverence, to revere the Lord. That's all the difference in the world. Therefore, the word that's used by you. Uh, Made ages ago of an entirely different meaning. I don't know. But I can't conceive of a God of love. And who so loved me, he became me. In any way, we invented it. I can't conceive of it. Especially when I read the scripture in the book of, well, the book of uh, Romans. The 11th chapter of Romans. And God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon us. If he forced me to be to have to disobey, well then why complain? You read in the eleventh chapter of the book of Romans, and God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. He's a God of mercy. If I didn't disobey with his prompting, I would never know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. In other words, conscience would not be born. I could remain forever in a garden of innocence. But I must leave innocence and enter the world of experience. To enter the world of experience, I have to come up from innocence through disobedience. And disobedience awoke within me conscience. Conscience must be awakened. You know, in the world in which we live, we didn't travel from space, we travel in consciousness. And in this very world today, there are those walking with us who conscience hasn't been born. They have no knowledge of right and wrong, none of us will. In the Bar Davis, where I was just a few months ago, my nephew sat on the jury. A man is on trial for an obvious theft. He was caught with the goods, he had other goods in his home, he stole. On the jury, this boy is saying, I don't see anything wrong with that. A jury. So my nephew said, you see nothing wrong in the man stealing just against the law of the land. You are here because you promised when you took the oath that you would uphold the law of the land. And that's the law of the land. So I see nothing wrong in it. If I was hungry, I'd go next door and uh, steal a chicken. I'd steal his corn. I'd steal anything. You call it stealing. I wouldn't call it stealing. It is the end And he held out against the end of the leopard of a trial with a jury. And he would not bring in a unanimous verdict. So 
If I don't accept the incarnation, one who was born with a hunchback or deformed in any way, it would prove an unjust God. My dear, to me, God plays all the parts. 